one thing that I found is like, there's tech that sounds good on paper, you buy it, and then it just kind of like sits as a bookmark in your, your web browser and you never use, and then there's tech that you're in every day using because there's value. And I think it comes down not so much to the perceived value of it. I mean, obviously there's value why you bought mm-hmm. that first one, but it comes down to the, the UI, how easy is it to use? and does it incorporate into your day-to-day workflow? Single most important things that I that I can think of, and I think that's why I love Matt and Ilya's strategy with why they built Loxo. It's built around a workflow. It's not built around specific point solutions of a database. So like, here's 50,000 prospects that we could land, and then you think you're gonna go one by one through those 50,000, and you're gonna waste a lot of time, waste a lot of resources, waste a lot of money doing it. Uh, you should be grading those, really figuring out like who are truly like, if you go in and do an analysis of your own current clients, they'll usually be able to do like an 80-20 type thing where you're going to see 20% of your clients probably make up 80% of your revenue. Figure out what it is that is common between them. Welcome to another episode of The Staffing Ring. I'm your host, Jason Lawson, and today our guest is Sam Keenley. VP of Marketing at Loxo. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. Looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we're going to go you know, into some really interesting topics here. Um, yeah, your role at Loxo, uh, you know, VP of Marketing, obviously you have a great view of the market and also keen to kind of, you know, pick your brains a bit from your previous roles, uh, VP of Marketing and Demand Gen at Refine Labs. Um you know, a, a, an agency that did amazing and does still does amazing work, uh, helping B2B SaaS companies, you know, scale their demand gen and marketing, um, through some pretty innovative tactics. So, mm-hmm. um, excited. So yeah, if you'd like to give the audience a, you know, quick, um, intro to Loxo, I'm sure it's, you know, pretty well-known brand and a bit about yourself. Yeah. All right. Quick intro to Loxo or a talent intelligence platform. What the heck does that thing mean? I've never heard of it. Um, Recruiters listening to this, uh, no, you know, in your in your day to day workflow, you've got an ATS you're dealing with, a recruiting CRM you're dealing with, some sourcing platform. You need contact information for those individuals on how do you get in touch with them, how do you email them, how do you text them. Okay, cool, they're in the system. I need to report. I need to get in touch with all of our clients through a portal. You're bouncing between your too many tabs in, in Google Chrome. It probably wants to crash on you at the end of of what you're trying to do, and it's slow and it's it's not a cohesive workflow. So a talent intelligence platform has your exact workflow in one place. So it's super easy. You can work jobs, biz dev, you can get in touch with con- with your different candidates, um, clients, anything all within one spot. So you have one tab. It's beautiful. It's easy and it's so easy to use. So um, it's really, it's just a consolidation of time, energy. And I also say like mind space. It's, it's just so many less things to let recruiters have to think about so they can focus on what they do best, which is recruiting at the end of the day, not managing their tech. Yeah, and I think yeah, certainly you know, seeing what Loxo built, you know, previously you'd you'd kind of have to decide between the all in one or the best of breed. Now I can see mm-hmm. Loxo really, you know, doing both really in terms of yeah, bringing all that um, workflow, data, um, automation, AI, all into one platform. So, um, right, let's get stuck into it. Everything on the staffing ring is fast paced, so let's let's go into round one. All right, but Sam, we're talking about challenges like. We're, we're recording this kind of mid 2024. Obviously, you know, the economy is, is in flux, but also, you know, staffing recruiting is, is not where it was 2021, 2022. What, what are you seeing just from, you know, the clients and, and the, and the, you know, conversations you're having at, at Loxo in terms of the key developments? What, what are the market forces that, you know, agency leaders should really be thinking about in today's environment? Mm-hmm. Business development. I know it's not sexy. I know it's it's a it's a common thing, but so many organizations are struggling with retaining clients, getting new clients, and also just how go about like how do you acquire them? Because as you said, you know, 2020, 21, 22, the people were coming to you. It was so easy. You didn't have to do business development. All you had to do was have a website and a LinkedIn presence and people were gonna find you and be like, Hey, I wanna hire you. I'm trying to trying to fill these these roles, right? And now it's the opposite side where it's a completely different market. And I know like in the United States, just the other day, they announced that there were just shy of like, they overestimated the jobs report by nearly a million over the past 12 months. And I mean, that was like a 30% drop. So that's significant, right? And so you see that happening. 
And recruiters are wondering, why can't I get jobs? It's like, well, <laughs> there's a lot fewer jobs out there than, than what people were thinking. So yeah, the biggest thing that we're seeing time and again is just how can I attract new business or how can I keep an, and or expand the existing clients I have if they're not hiring? Like what other offers can I, can I help them with to, to keep them? Yeah, and, and certainly you know, it, it is one of the biggest um, you know, challenges and, and opportunities. And I think there's a lot of roles out there which are probably, you know, available to for an agency to go scope out. I think it's a lot of businesses are hesitant, um, you know, and, and so it, it takes that business development to really, um, you know, do perhaps that good, as I say, business development muscle, demanding mm. muscle in terms of, um, uh, you know, I'm curious on that then, what, what are you seeing in terms of that B2B SaaS kind of mindset of business development and demand gen that can really translate into how staffing agency can think about that, that more proactive um, building awareness and pipeline? Yeah. So the two things that I would say, one is something I learned in B2B SaaS and one is that I learned when I was at the agency, which is a services company. So B2B SaaS, the biggest thing that I, I learned, saw, and what we told our clients was just assume 95% of the market, they're not looking to buy. They're not looking to hire. They're not looking to bring out another agency. So don't treat them like that. The goal isn't, hey, let's get on a call and I want to tell you why I'm the best recruiter out there and why you need to hire my firm. That's not what you need to do. You need to build trust with them. But before that, you need to build awareness. So they even know you exist before they finally do have that hiring need. Because the last thing that you want to do is show up when they finally say, I have a need, I need to hire, I need a staffing agency. And they go to Google best staffing agency in insert city, insert region for certain job type, right? But you want to win before Google. And so how you do that is by building the awareness and building the trust beforehand so that 95% of the market educate them, uh, help them provide value, entertain them, but something to make your brand, your agency memorable. And that's what's going to lead to them coming back. So when they're finally like, we do need to start thinking about hiring. They're not going to go to Google and type in that, that search phrase. They're they don't want to waste that mental time to try to figure out that information, do the research. This is the same reason why as soon as someone's like, hey, do you know a good freelance designer? Do you know a good uh, financial firm that we can reach out to? People want to recommend and they go to that first. So if you can earn that spot, you're going to win head and shoulders over everyone else. Yeah, yeah, that resonates so, so much with, you know, the conversations that we have here at Ringover in terms of, you know, where clients are at and customers and prospects. And how how do you see the kind of landscape in terms of those agencies that kind of understand that, you know, they will be nodding as they listen to this call and the mm -hmm. podcast versus, you know, but, you know, perhaps they just don't understand how to actually execute and, and get the tool set versus those that they're still doing it in the 2022 mm -hmm. model. Yeah. So you teed me up perfectly for the thing that I learned while at Refine Labs as an agency trying to bring on our own clients is... And this is what's so beautiful about being a services company versus software is you are the product at the end of the day, your knowledge, your expertise, like that's your unique value, your selling proposition that no one else has. So the more that you can highlight that and demonstrate that, basically just show people what it's going to be like to work with you, not the, I'm the best agency recruiter in the world. I'm the best staffer in the world. You know, everyone can say that, right? Go to, go to 20 websites. They're all going to say world's leading number one, this best of that. But if you can prove it to them beforehand, so like get on a podcast, share videos, write up newsletters or blogs, but just share that expertise, that's where you win that. And they start to understand like, oh, wow, like Jason really does know his stuff. Like I fully see it. Um, and so by practically getting ahead of that, it's the easiest thing that you can do from a marketing or biz dev side, because what I always say is just the scenarios that you go through every day, that's your your niche, your ICP, that's the same things that they're struggling with. So just anonymize it. Take out the client's name and just say, I was working with a company that's trying to solve for XYZ. Here's what we did. You know, I was working for a company that wanted to hire this type of role. Here's how I approached it. Just take out the name. And that is the best marketing material that you can use because it's real. It's relatable. They can see themselves in the shoes of that type of organization that you're working with. And you're able to show results, how you think about it, how you approach it. And that's what's going to differentiate you from from everyone else. And especially if you do it in a different or a better way, it's a perfect way of, of doing it without saying, like, we're the world's best this. But like, let me show you how we are and why we get the results that we do. Right. Yes. Yeah. And in, in thinking about those sort of tactics and strategies, 
do do you feel like there's perhaps some big dynamics or market forces yeah even coming in the next six or twelve months perhaps with AI or automation that a lot of agencies may be not kind of fact plans. I think a lot of them are trying, like so many people are skeptical of AI in the sense of they've seen the, the quality of the output of it, like the, the AI written email templates, the AI written anything. And honestly, it works to the, the benefit of the person by not using it in a way or like let AI do like use generator to write 80% of your business development email. But then you go and you take the direction, you take the meat of it. Now you go add in your personality, add in your flavor, add in your context, your unique knowledge. And that's how you can get ahead. So you can either do it by just like going to the one side and say, I'm not going to do AI at all. Um, if you're very boutique, very niche, like you want to do it anyway for one to one, you're going to have a list of here's a hundred accounts, a hundred prospects that I would only ever be able to work with, develop those relationships, take that approach. If you are a little bit broader then as I say, like use, like we have outreach GPT built into our product for this exact thing. And I don't tell people, I, I don't say like, send it as it is. That's the last thing I'll tell people to do is, is just send it, whatever spit out, like you need to go in and tweak it and, and make the use of it. But, um, that, that can span into anything from your business development or from what you want to do for your own marketing, sales, talk tracks, anything else. Like you can, you can leverage it. However, however works best for you, but don't lose that human element because that's where all of the trust is gained and if they read through it and they see it's kind of like the personalization tokens as soon as you see personalization token in an email especially a bad one yeah. you're like man this is just copy and pasted they didn't spend the time to do it so that same that same thing it's just it's a layer deeper with gen ai versus some of those things that excuse me we'd had in an email platforms the last couple of decades yeah yeah and i'm sure you know everyone listening has, has seen those kind of dear first name and then the rest is is you know very vanilla and broad um and look i think you know it's cliche but you know yeah, we we hear a lot that ai is not going to take a recruiter's role it's somebody who works with ai who understands how to you know collaborate with the ai tools to get the best you know service to their clients and candidates um Awesome. Well, we're, we're moving quickly. So round two, I think we've I feel like we've already got into strategies and tactics to win. Um, but I, I want to dive a bit deeper, Sam, into terms of specifics and, and again, you know, w where we can bring out kind of B2B SaaS models, because I think there's, there's a lot to be learned from other industries and, and really focusing in on how can that help staffing and recruiting. So thinking about kind of business development or, um, you know, bring in new tool sets and new ways of working. Have, have you seen kind of innovation or unconventional ways that agencies are really thinking about that blend of technology, people and process and, you know, AI and automation? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I am the first person to always say like tech should be the last thing that you get to. Um, I've, I lived through the MarTech boom, right? So I saw so many companies go and just purchase hundreds of thousands of dollars on software and then try to build a strategy around their tech, which is the last thing that you want to do. You need to have a strategy and then you figure out, okay, what are the tools? What are the processes? What are the resources and people hmm. that we need to accomplish that strategy? So the first thing I always say is just like the fundamentals are the fundamentals for a reason. So, um, the biggest thing, most overlooked thing in business development is truly defining not just your total addressable market, your TAM, but like who are your ideal customers? Um, you'll hear people talk about these as your, as your ICP, but that's the biggest thing is you might have a database of like, there's 50,000 prospects that we could land on then You think you're going to go one by one through those 50,000 and you're going to waste a lot of time, waste a lot of resources, waste a lot of money doing it. Uh, you should be grading those, really figuring out like who are truly like, if you go in and do an analysis of your own current clients, well, usually we'll do like an 80, 20 type thing where you're going to see 20% of your clients probably make up 80% of your revenue, figure out what it is that is common between them. Is it the types of roles that they hire, the seniority levels, the industry that they're in, the, the offer, the specific offer that they're interested with you and start to work backwards from that and then define, okay, now that I know that I'm going to take that 50,000 universe and figure, okay, there's actually only 10,000 of those who fit the criteria that would actually be really great fit for me. Cause otherwise you're kind of stretching and you're wondering why you're losing deals. Things aren't closing. Yeah. Give yourself the best opportunity to win. And that's where I often say like, don't even think about channels, messaging, anything else before that. You got to start with where are you most likely 
to win. And then you start to cascade down from there. So I'll stop there for a sec before I go to the next part. So, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's there. What I've heard is, you know, really thinking about the fundamental core elements of the offer and, and, you know, effectively recruiting staffing as a two-sided marketplace. So trying to match out mm-hmm. the candidate and the client and, and the placements, um, you know, all of that is predicated on, you know, good data. So how, how are your clients kind of thinking about or, or using Loxo to, you know, make sure the data is rich enough and, and relevant and contextual enough to actually, you know, make those decisions? Yeah, that's, I don't even call it the million dollar question. That's a billion dollar question because Zoom Info has built a business model off of it and they're a billion dollar company, right? Huh. Um, so, I mean, for every company, every software, every tech out there, I will tell you as a marketer, even as someone at Loxo, no tech will ever have perfect data. It just, it's, it's not going to happen. So um, I've just seen countless recruiters agencies bounce from Zoom Info to Apollo, to us, to Lucia, to, you know, insert any, any of those options. They're always like, the data is not good. Well, what's your standard? A hundred percent. It's never going to be a hundred percent anywhere. So that's what you need to kind of come to terms with a little bit on that side. But in terms of the enrichment side, that's where you can be a little bit smarter and figure out, okay, what can be automated? What needs to be done manually? So like that, that audience of 10,000 accounts earlier that we were talking about, say you graded them A, B, C, D, F. Thousand of them were in your A group. You should be able to know or get, if you quickly went into your CRM, your uh, sales CRM, what's their account? What's their website? How many employees do they have? What do they serve? Like what are their products? Who are key contacts within there? And you can go about enriching that two ways. You can use automation. You can get a tool like the ones I mentioned, Zoom Info, Apollo, Loxo does it too. Um, or you can do it manually. If you have a BDR team, you can outsource it to to somewhere like a, a freelancer anywhere else. There's there's multiple options there. So once you really have that data, that's where you need to make it work to your advantage, so to speak. Because if you have, if all you know is an account name, your BDRs, your marketing, whoever it is, they're going to be spending more time on the research part of it, which makes it really tricky. So to go into the next step of, of what I like to think about is this concept that I'm really playing with for Loxo and in general, and just with how today's market buys is I call it, you need to create a go-to-market ecosystem. And what I mean by that is for so long in the B2B SaaS world, you have a sales function, you yeah. have a BDR function, you have a marketing function, you have a partner function, you are, you have all these different revenue streams, right? Yeah. And they all work in silos going like that. But the reality is that there's so much interplay between them where like you see, this is why attribution fighting exists. Who should get credit for this deal? Who should get credit for this? And it's like, we both know that these are these are things that take three, six, 12 months to come to fruition, if not more. And usually it's from the relationship side. So does the person who took them out to lunch one time get credit for it? Does the one ad that got them to your website for the first time get credit for it? Like there's so many different things within there. And I think the wrong question is what should get credit? And the right question is how do we stack these different motions so that they interplay off of one another to create a disproportionate advantage? for us. Like right. these are force multipliers off of one another. If you do it properly and you stop fighting over credit, I work with our BDR team now. And I say, here's the accounts that we want to go after. Like what messaging are you using? Here's what we're currently pushing to market. If I time it up so that they can see an ad before the BDR calls, that changes the dynamic of mm-hmm. the, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm Sam calling from Loxo. How are you? And the, the prospects like, wait, Loxo, what is that? I've never heard of it. You know, like I don't have time right. for this click laying yeah. up to, Oh yeah, Loxo. I just saw a study about like what you did with this this customer that's just like me. Like curious uh, or great timing, you know. The conversation is open then. So two completely different instances where, you know, the BDR makes a call and the outcome is completely different because of what preceded it. Not to say that one of those isn't more valuable than the other, but it just shows like that's a force multiplier effect. And why I say when you think about your business development strategies, really think about ecosystems. What are all the different places that you can engage, get in touch, communicate with your market, and just think about how they how they interplay with one another and just put yourself in the shoes of your prospect to do that. Don't overthink it. You don't have to use, like, get crazy, like, what tech do I need first for this or anything else? Just be like, all right, when was the last time I bought something? How did we go about it as an organization? And then it's just like, what research occurred? Who did you talk to? What did you listen to? And just think through it from that motion. Then you can start to construct with your ICP. How do we build something similar to that for us? 
And that's that's kind of the I almost call it, it simplifies things a little bit because you're not so reliant on tech yeah. attribution, paying for all the crazy stuff. It's just like consistently do the right things, provide value, be helpful, and just be like the relationship side is so important with it. Make sure you're getting FaceTime with them and just like being a, a trusted face versus Jason's calling in. I know he's going to try to sell me on something this month. Like it's it's such a different dynamic. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think we should... Um we should really pause there because I just, you know, what you've been <laughs> spoken through and delivered there, Sam, I think, you know, we could, we could just press play and repeat and, and just, yeah, you know, that is golden, you know, and I can, I can really appreciate and, you know, the, the experience you've gained through, you know, your years of marketing and refined labs to actually have that, that view. And, and I think, you know, for a lot of the audience, you know, whether in small to medium agent, agencies and the staff and recruiting, you know, how to apply that, how to really think about, you know, what, what's the ecosystem of touch points to their client base and, and to their candidate base too. Like, you know, particularly in permanent and exec search, you know, candidates can often be, you know, the next day a client. So mm -hmm. yeah, how, how, how are you thinking about if you're not doing 360 recruiting, if you've got your BD team and your, and your candidate, you know, team, how, how's that messaging you know, how are you aligning the positioning and messaging across the agency? Um, are there any other things you can th think about in terms of all, all that good stuff you've spoken about from from your perspective and how agencies can really think about, um, you know, deploying that, that mindset? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, then you can, how do you use tech to your advantage to accomplish all of it? So knowing what's your end goals, what are you trying to accomplish? Do you have tech that can allow you to, okay, here's the companies that I want to go after. Do you have a place where you can store them? Do you have a sales CRM for that? Can you track the conversations that you've had with them? Can you leave notes and activities for yourself? Does that information stay up to date? Say they move jobs, they go to a new place. Do you get a quick flag to just say like, hey, you know, Jason just moved to a new company. He was a client here. They're not a client there. That's a great opportunity for us to go prospect to them since he's familiar and he knows the results that we can drive. So use tech for things like that. And then even on, on the research side, there's, there's tools like copy AI out there, which are absolutely phenomenal on the research front. And what I love about, it, I had, I had Kyle Coleman, he's their CMO on our podcast, um, just a few, a few weeks ago, sorry, they were in early August. I don't know when this episode is going to go out, but, um, early August on our podcast Yeah, and he was just running through all that their platform does and it's it's absolutely brilliant because it basically takes all the front end research out that usually takes a bdr or an ae someone 20 30 minutes to accomplish to do it well so you can then craft a message to understand what do they do what's this person's title what do they care about what current things are going on within their business and it does all that research it looks at you know podcasts that they could have been on any social posts it does research on their company just like the who are they um industry reports, any press releases that they've put out, um, earnings reports, and it consolidates all that for you in two minutes. I mean, it just depends on what you put in. And so that's where I say, like, once you know your strategy, once you hone in on those accounts, that's where you can then use tech to just say, okay, like we've got a thousand accounts that I do want to do personalized one-to-one -one outreach on. And people are like, well, that's still a lot of emails. That's a lot of messages. How can I do that research? That's where you take the tech like yeah. this, that goes and takes what would have been 30 minutes into 30 seconds. Now you can craft that outreach and say like, you know, hey, Jason, just saw your CEO's post the other day about XYZ. Seems like you guys are focused on ABC. Like, figure out just like what your value pitch is from there, that value that you can add, the content. But it gets so much of that manual part out of the way. And that's exactly what tech should be helping with so that you can do the parts that you do best, which is the relationship side of it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm going to take note. Uh, actually, just last night, I was looking at copy.ai and, and thinking about signing up. So maybe you're, uh, in terms of attribution, <laughs> let's see how, how I can write that down when I, when I sign up later today. Um, and I'll drop exactly. I want, to tell I, I, be, I want a commission. Copy.ai. I will have it. Quick sign up for, for being an affiliate and then I'll sign up with your, with your link. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. Maybe he'll send me some stickers as a thank you. And, uh, yeah, just for the audience, again, I'll drop in the show notes, um, become, becoming a hiring machine. Is that right, Sam, your podcast? Mm -hmm. yep. Um, yeah, I've yep. listened to a few episodes, I think brilliant guests, brilliant talk tracks. So, um, definitely recommend, uh, you know, cross promoting a, a podcast on a podcast. How, how meta is that? Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate that. So, I mean, we're doing the same thing as you, just like, how do we help recruiters do better? We're not trying to sell you anything, but just 
the day to day. What's yeah. going on? What can you learn? How can you apply it? Absolutely. Um, right. Let's go round three. Getting getting deep into the into the rounds now. So we're talking product. I think we've we've really delved you know much already a lot into this into product innovations. Um, I think you know certainly what what still is a pain point for a lot of agencies, particularly small medium agencies, is yeah it's a tough business, right? Managing, leading, mm-hmm. staffing. This high turnover. These young graduates coming in, training, people being remote and hybrid. How how do you think you know from a and you you've said it you know don't don't just jump in and and, and load stuff up with technology but and at the same time you're saying co- copy AI and 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 various things so how how should agency leaders when when they don't have a lot of resource and not a lot of time how can they think about balancing the people and the technology and wanting to stay ahead and and innovate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, today, yeah, there's so many tech options out there, right? Like if you're a rock, you're going to somehow, it's going to slide into Tenna, hit all of them. Um, one thing that I found is like, there's tech that sounds good on paper, you buy it, and then it just kind of like sits as a bookmark in your, your web browser and you never use. And then there's tech that you're in every day using because there's value. And I think it comes down not so much to the perceived value of it. I mean, obviously there's value why you bought mm-hmm. that first one, but it comes down to the the UI. How easy is it to use and does it incorporate into your day-to-day workflow? So those are the two single most important things that I that I can think of. And I think that's why I love Matt and Ilya's strategy with why they built Loxo. It's built around a workflow. It's not built around specific point solutions. It's like, what's a recruiter need to accomplish? Mm. How do they do it? And as few steps as possible or as few clicks as possible, so to speak. So I think that's the first part is if you can make it easier, people are going to want to make their job. Like, how can I be more effective? How can I make my job easier and still get the same or better results? So that comes from the workflow side of it. And then you just have to deal with adoption because you could have the best workflow ever. But if you're looking at a you know piece of tech that looks like it was built on Windows 95, <laughs> you're not going to get good adoption, especially from some of these new grads or other places. They're just like, there's so many better ways of doing this. I'm just going to use ChatGPT to skip half this stuff because I don't like using this platform. So that's on the tech then to make sure that they're building for just how people use software today and that's best practice that's product design at the end of the day so um i would i would definitely look at that because i think that also is an insight into the company and how they look at the market their future are they building for the future or are they just building to keep the money that they have right now and just kind of rest on their laurels are they innovating or not so um yeah i mean i'm sure there's a lot of a lot of details other other check boxes that you could get into but i honestly say the the simplest uh level whether it's Rec tech, martech, sales tech, anything. Those are the two things that I that I really look at. Is just like, how does this as part of my workflow, and is it easy to use? Where some like the the barrier to entry, the change management load is going to be light to minimal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you know, think about UI and UX. It's the user. So you know, a lot of yeah, and and this goes across many industries where platforms are are, are kind of bought without that kind of deep understanding of okay, the recruiters. Other, is this going to be an enjoyable experience for them? And, and you know, a great technology setup can be, you know, actually attractive to, you know, for talent recruitment into the, into the agency, but also talent, you know, retention. So, yeah. you know, for, for me, it's, it's more than just, um, d- does it solve a problem? It, is it actually, is it a joined up solution that people can, you know, it can empower your team to do more and, um, be effective and, and efficient. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And one thing that's interesting within there is call like integrations or the marketplace. You see, you're like, are you integrated with this product? Are you, do you, do you connect with that one? And I would say to think a little bit more about the question you're asking, cause I mean, it's so easy that you can integrate anything. You can pop anything through Zapier nowadays, but if you're still jumping from systems, it's not really syncing in properly. Mm-hmm. Is that the question that you should be asking is it solving for what you want it to do or is it just like it's saving you a couple clicks whereas if you think about the true workflow like why isn't this just all in one spot or is there a better way to do this so i've just i've seen a lot of integrations where we're integrated but then you find out that it's <laughs> it, it, yeah technically but it's a lot of copy and pasting it's a lot of duplicative work it's not it's not a true software integration and that so like 
regardless of what type of software you're buying, that's one of the first things I always get into is if they're trying to sell you on the partner marketplace or the integrations, mm. I would look at that because they're using that as a crutch to solve many other features, things that you need to do as a day to day, and they're relying on someone else to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think even some of the largest marketplaces, you know, you know, talk about kind of app exchanges of of many sorts and out in B two B land, that they're still not plug and play. You know, that they still need often a system integrator that becomes an expensive and sometimes complex way to kind of develop and keep keep with your business as it grows. Uh, so yeah, I can certainly see a lot of you know modern reasons why yeah that that more all in one play can become much more compelling for for agencies today. Um, brilliant. Well, let's let's get on to round four, speedball. So this is some quick fire Q and A for you, Sam. Um, ah. Hope you warmed up enough for this. Here we go. <laughs> we'll find out. So let's uh, let's see. Like you you're walking into the into the stadium, and you know the the rings in the middle of the stadium. There. What what what's your walk on music theme song? Oh man, that's a good one. I don't know why this one's in my head. Have you seen the movie Three Hundred? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, I can't think of the, it's one of the songs that plays in there. I know this is an awful answer right now. Cause I'm just like, you know, that one song for 300, but it's like, this is going to drive me crazy. I'll follow up with you on it. We'll, I will link it. All right. I'll send it to we'll, you. We'll drop in the show notes. They're, but it's one of the ones that just like gives you the goosebumps. Yes. Yeah. Like with this big opening scene. Yeah. So it's our terrible answer. No, I need to decide if you want to use this or not. No, I think I, I can I can almost almost put it in my mind, but uh, you know, okay, it'll be a surprise for those who uh, drop into the show notes and see that. Uh, talking fighting, um, best movie, Fight Club or Rocky? We oh, I want to say Fight Club, but Rocky's such a classic. Like Fight Club's a good movie, but Rocky is an absolute classic. It is. It is. Um, red corner or blue corner? Just like color or what's color, the just color? What? Yeah. So some people red. come from. I grew up. Huh? Red. I was really red. All my, all the, the soccer teams I played for growing up, the winning ones, we were always red. There you go. That That's um, probably nine times out of 10, it comes from a sports team people follow or play for. So interesting. Yep. Um, beach or snow? Beach. Beach. I, uh, I live in Florida. We used to be in South Carolina. Like, we're always on the coast, right on the ocean. So wow. our living choice very much has uh, answered that for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, coffee or tea? Coffee. I know. I'm American. I'm sorry. Good but I, I got my cold brew already right here. Nice. Salsa guacamole? Oh, guacamole. Gu Absolutely guacamole. I got our family. We have this uh, recipe for homemade guacamole. Every time family gets together and everything, it's just... It's you go to the store, you get it pre-made. It's not the same as just yeah. fresh guac. That you'd be amazed at how quickly a family four, six, eight can clean a bowl that had like eight avocados in it. Well, no pun intended, but yeah, guacamole is smashing salsa through these uh, Q and A's. So um, yeah, I well, believe it. Are you t are you a texter or a caller? How do people get hold of you? I'm a texter. No, ah. I'm a texter. It's just easier. Yeah. On the go. I'm all, between, you know, we were talking before, and I've got a 16 month old trying to get a hold of me on the phone and where I can sit for five minutes is not nice, existing right. right now unless it's after like 9 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Multitasking at its finest. Virtual or in real life? In real life. I always enjoy presence. Of, and I know it's ironic because I work at a, at a remote company, right? But yeah, anytime you're getting people together, it's always it's always fun, it's always enjoyable, and it's just it's a different level to relationships. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. I didn't know Vloxo was fully remote. Um, I knew mm -hmm. both hybrid, but uh, yeah, I think yeah. that. Post-COVID, fully remote, teams distributed internationally. I mean, it's cool, the just the, the culture that comes in as a result of it. Yeah, yeah. You, you do build different muscles, don't you, to really you know, develop mm -hmm. that culture and that that team spirit yeah exactly um all right i'm gonna by bypass this question well I, i'll throw it to you fifth to breed or all in one i think you know the answer to that one we are all in one all day and best of breed. Best of breeds. <laughs> yeah absolutely um ebooks or physical books 
physical books. I can't do ebooks. I just, I don't know why. I'm the kind of guy that I've got, I've always got a pen while I'm reading books. I mark them up and then they're my trophies afterward. I like my bookshelf. I mean, I, my goal at the end of my life is just have a library, just shelves on shelves really? of books. So yeah, all day. Awesome. Um, talking books, any, um, any recent good reads or, or old classic recommendations for the audience? Oh, recent good reads, classic recommendations. I'm looking at the, the ones I've gone through recently. Some of them are just like late night scrub reads. Just check my mind out. Um, but let's see. There's one, it's called Boyd, the fighter pilot who changed like the art of war. Um, biography. He was a, an air force fighter pilot who helped design the, I think it was the F. 15 and f16 or f14 and f15 but um the ooda loop are you familiar with the the observe orient decision action it's kind of like a feedback loop okay okay so he designed like that was his his yeah uh methodology that he came up with and it came from fighter jets that just came down and cascaded even to the tech world and, and everywhere else but um interesting interesting man who basically his premise was you can be someone and like you can go high in an organization, have the title, have everyone that, or you can do something. You can make a change. You're probably going to ruffle some feathers. You're, you're not going to be loved by everyone, but you'll make significant change and meaning in the world. Right. So just a really cool story about this character and what he went through. Yeah. I the character, he was a real person, but, um, yeah, I think that was, that's, that's hands down probably my, my favorite book of all time so far. Uh, yeah. I've not heard of it. So I'll see and look it up and, uh, yeah, drop in the show notes again for those, um, wanting to to have a have a look um Perfect. yeah sounds sounds really fascinating actually um i think you know thinking about staffing and recruiting as a as a you know very focused a agency kind of model i think there's there's always a lot of external kind of other businesses or industries where they can learn a lot from you know and, and vice versa but i think it's um yeah and that's you know part of the reason the podcast is really to bring some different thinking and kind of you know perspectives and and hopefully help mm -hmm. um agencies just you know do more and 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 keep growing so um yeah thank you yeah i mean there's a time to learn from you know the the thought leaders in your space but there's also so much to be learned when you get outside of your own bubble and you'd be amazed at how much you can apply from those external pl places and just translate it to what you do the scenarios you're in a lot of those learnings carry over mm. yeah yeah okay we're cooling down we uh we've Plexed to think a few <laughs> insightful muscles here today. So yeah, awesome. Just just to wrap up, Sam. You know, thinking about the next kind of six or twelve months. You know, I think there are a lot of good signals. You know, it's still going to be moving from that sort of you know surviving to thriving mode. What what excites you about the industry, like staffing, recruiting, agency industry? It's one of very few jobs that truly impacts a person's life when you think about it like you're you're finding people the role that's perfect for them or should be at the end of the day right and when you think about your job i mean we spend 24 hours in today eight hours at work eight hours sleeping so not eight eight hours for for your personal stuff like on average you know we're talking about here but yeah like a, a third of a person's mm -hmm. life at that point like you're helping them figure out what they're doing with that so I don't know many more impactful things that the person isn't directly choosing themselves that you can influence. So when you really think about like, I get to help this person find like the perfect job for them in an organization that they'll thrive in, a role that they're enjoying on, um, you know, whether it's a product, a service, uh, whatever it is. But mm, mm. Um, I know people always say like, no one went to school to be a recruiter, but it's actually a really cool position when you think about the impact that you can have with it. So... For me, that's why I always say yeah. like that's something that'll always excite me about the industry is is just like the the capacity for what you're able to accomplish. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm right with you. you know, having been kind of in the industry the last three or four years, you're really just understanding and seeing the the impact. And and you know, prior to that, having been on both sides of the table and you know, applying and, and recruiting, there's still a lot of opportunity for you know people and and technology to help improve that matching process um significantly and yeah i think that you know that can boost as i say people's careers the company prospects and actually the entire economy if you know 
if that matching can you know level up um yeah it's to me it could be you know transformational you know beyond what many or most industries are capable of so yeah, yeah and i know we're in the cool down i don't want to completely throw us off guard but like that's why um, you know, things like skills-based hiring are so interesting to me when it's not yeah. like, how do you transfer the skills of someone into something where, you know, say they were earning $15 an hour over here that they could make $150 an hour over there. They just didn't know that their skills could transfer to that. So that's, that's your role and what you can help people do. Like you're, that's impacting livelihoods. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like that, that, um, example of taking a bottle of water that's sold in the local, you know, supermarket through to, you know, maybe a restaurant or maybe to an airline, that same bottle, but in a different context is the value, mm -hmm. you know, multiplies. Yeah. Awesome. So wrapping up, any questions I should have asked you or any kind of takeaways do you kind of want to just, you know, wrap up with the, for the audience today? Yeah. I mean, my biggest one, it's what we, what we say at locks all the time. Just like, be curious. Think, don't just accept things the way that they always are just because, you know, you've always done recruiting a certain way. Your company's always done in a certain way. Just think, is there a better way? If so, what would it look like? And don't think in terms of tech yet. Like, just think of like, what would the perfect flow for this be? And I would love it if that's with Loxo. Most of the time, it might not be. I don't care. But just like taking that that scope with like anything that you do, if you're in marketing, if you're in sales, if you're in engineering, if you're a manual labor, just I always, I always say, you know, just because things have always been done a certain way doesn't mean that they should continue to. And I think that's that's what excites most people, and that's where we continue to really see just crazy positive results. So, um, yeah, that's I, I guess that's kind of the thing that I would say to wrap up with. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm not going to add any, anything to that because I think that is, you know, just the essence of, you know, this whole conversation and 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 your kind of you know outlook and um yeah you know, certainly from what I see in in Loxo and and the and the good work you're doing out there so um that's it that's a wrap um thank you Sam very much for being a guest on the Staffing Ring podcast yeah I love this conversation thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, everyone, that is a wrap. Thank you again for joining us um, on this edition of the Staffing Ring podcast and look forward to seeing you again soon.